parça oldu diye bir dengelik ama biliyorsunuz Yunanistan Avrupa Birliği'nin parçası. Daha önceki tarımların olağanüstü kısmı Avrupa Birliği tarafından desteklenen e, ve bankacılık sistemi tarafından e, kredilerle e, kuvvetlendirilmiş bir sistemdi. Bizim her dakika yaşadığımız krizleri onlar tarihleri içerisinde sayabiliyorlar. 1800'lerden itibaren üçüncüsünü yaşıyorlar. Onlar için son derece derin bir kriz olmakla beraber bizim için hani çok gördük bunlardan şeklinde bir kriz olmakla birlikte oturup düşünmeleri sebep veriyor. Küçük bir şeyleri var biliyorsunuz, e, nüfusları var, kıyaslanır bir durum değil. E, en büyük dertleri de bu kapla ilgili yani ortak Avrupa Birliği'nin ortak tarım politikaları ile ilgili mesela. Bizdeki e, hareketlerle ilgili aramızda çok e, dostumuz var. Levent, Levent göremiyor buradaki ışık danseri neredesin? Harika. E, mesela Ekolojik Üreticiler Derneği'nin tohum takas şenlikleri gibi. E, aramızda permakültürcüler var. Bugün hatta başlayan yeni bir kurs var. Şehirleri ciddi anlamda toprağa yaklaşacağım. Bizim üyelerimizin bir kısım burada olamadılar bile. Ama biz e, İstanbul'da ya da Türkiye dediğim, Sözde büyüyen bir ekonomin içerisinde adım adım daha fazla tüketebilirken öteki tarafta eğitimlerine rağmen işte dünya kadar dibimene bütün o şıkıkları içerisinde bir yeniden toprağa dönmek durumunda hissenen kendi bir grup var. Pavlos, please join me now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here with us today. And experiences that you have collected uh, during these days while you were producing this uh, short documentary and while you were doing your video blog and perhaps the experiences that you will be developing in the near future. We will collaborate with you and we will uh, add to your experiences from this side of the, uh, not the border, the bridge, right? Sure. Um, I have to thank uh, you uh, so food FSD that uh, made this uh, screening possible and of course SALT for hosting us. Apart from helping all the wonderful people that helped realize this film from the director, Mr. Harris Donias, and to all the way to the people in Holland that funded it, uh, I think it is very strange and very funny that uh, Greece, Greece and Turkey, we share such a similar food culture but such a different food system. And unfortunately, it's very funny that we never in sync. I mean, at the moment, it seems like our economy is in boom and yours is going down. And with such common traditions, with such a common culture, it would have been better, right, if we were in sync. Why is this? I, sometimes I think of the conspiracy theory behind it. They don't want us to be on the same level, never. I don't really believe in conspiracy theories. I just think that it is just too complicated for our politicians to follow what the society does. And I'm not being cynical to our governments, not, not because I just don't depend on them so much, but I'm just so hopeful of the power of the civil society, what uh, your group in Turkey uh, is realizing in a huge bustling city like Istanbul, and what our, we are doing in Greece by rediscovering the stories of our farmers. And I think uh, we are experiencing a seminal change in the relationship between our cities and our countrysides, where the stories of the young farmers of Greece come here right in the center, in the heart of the city. And of course, this documentary uh, is not about only Greece. Uh, it's like taking the case of Greece uh, in order to um, touch global challenges like uh, food security, like uh, environmental degradation and young entrepreneurship. Um, and I think these are the type of connections that are so common. And uh, the fact that the economy goes up and down uh, should not distract us from the real crisis, which in my opinion is a crisis of values. Um, and it is a crisis that is encapsulated in the whole hypothesis of the documentary. What future can we expect? Actually, it's a worldwide crisis then. It's not a crisis that we're having in Greece. It's not just an economic crisis. It's a crisis of all the values that we held so for such a long time, like money. What does money mean? What does sustainability mean? What does uh, abundance mean? We lost all those words, right? Definitely, and we are now in a world that we we know so much, but we understand so little. And at the end, we pay so much money to put like good quality petrol in our cars, and we give ourselves such. We are feeding ourselves so poorly. Okay, you're an agrobotanist, right? 
An ethnobotanist. Exactly. Ethno, I'm sorry, ethnobotanist. I mean, this, this term, that terminology is, to me is a very new one. Uh, what made you make this movie? I mean, you're not, you, you study, you continue to study. How long has it been? Uh, it's, it's been quite a long time. Right? Of my life. Yes, about 12, so 13 years. What, what made you make this movie? I mean, you call yourself the producer of this mm -hmm. movie. So I was, I was outside Greece for about 13 years for my studies and research, and I had the privilege to travel to almost all over the world uh, for my studies and research. Uh, last year I went back in Greece and I found my this situation and uh, soon I realized that Greece has attracted so much political attention during the last year and also so much attention from the press. But unfortunately all the news that were coming out of Greece were sad news and bad news of like riots, political corruption, uh, economic inefficiency. And to me, coming from a city in the borders or in the bridge, um, it didn't sound quite right. I was sure that there is a new generation that can express a new Greece. And this is what I wished to discover through this journey throughout the country, to discover the stories of the people that are creating a more sustainable economy, a more sustainable society. And this is what I found. It was the Greece of productivity, the Greece of innovation, the Greece of collaboration that had nothing to do with what our TVs uh, were screening. And I'm particularly happy that like, uh, maybe we are start succeeding slowly to change this agenda, to show the undiscovered story of the Greek countryside, which can uh, right now is forming the, the, the opposite weight on the balance uh, of our society and of our, um, and of our economy. Of course, this film is a continuation of a video blog that uh, the youth food movement, the, slow food, the youth of slow food, created in the Holland. Why don't you tell us a little about uh, youth of slow food? Mm. I think um, as organizations grow, uh, and slow food has grown in importance and impact uh, hugely only in the last five years, and of course the last ten years, and of course 20 years ago no one would have imagined that gastronomy will get such a central stage, um, the centrality of food will get such an important role in our societies. and. Um, it's important for movements and organizations and institutions and ideas to pump new blood. And uh, it was a natural need that uh, the slow food had to invest in attracting young people. Because um, young people... Especially in Europe, it became a very old movement, right? Most of the convivial members say in Germany are uh, 60 plus. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. And, uh, you know, all those slow food um, has a very noble cause, noble in the sense it's like working in a higher level of consciousness, in my opinion, to be able to educate people to feed in a, in a way that does not grab food and land from another person in the world. And uh, this started um, losing a little bit its appeal to the masses. And of course, uh, our generation is a much more connected one. And um, uh, we have all these incredible tools in our hands, like social media, and uh, traveling and exchange became simply just too easy. And now technology gives us uh, the opportunity not only to connect, but also to broadcast ideas in massive uh, scales. And what we achieved with this uh, video blog is, uh, is, uh, is an indication of that. And not only that, like last month we were screening this film in Hollywood. And in my opinion it is... Uh, More importantly, the European Parliament. Also in the European Parliament, uh, the Minister of Agriculture has been tweeting about that, the EU Commissioner on Agriculture has been uh, communicating on this blog. So we as a civil society and as a youth network collaborated. We discovered actually the Europe, not Europe of stereotypes, but Europe of collaboration. Greece and Holland collaborated, we fundraised together, and we, for the first time, we demonstrating that it, the food systems are so diverse and so complicated and there is no way you can deliver one single common agricultural policy without side effects. So all these complexities were came to the surface, the comparison between Northern Europe, where the majority is large industrial farms, compared to the farms in Southern Europe, in the Mediterranean countries, where more than 80% of our farms are small scale. It is now that these complexities come to the surface, and of course this is more pressure to our politicians, there is more pressure to our consumers, and in my opinion I think we are, through collaboration, we are raising awareness and we are extrapolating a discussion from the level of the society, like the guerrilla gardeners, 
who, by the way, that urban garden was a former army camp. In my opinion, this is a great symbolism. And these people, only two years ago, they turned an army camp into a huge rural garden. In my opinion, these are the people that are driving real change in the world. To bring this voice in the center of decision making in the European Union, I think, is big. Okay, this is all happening in the rural areas, or is, is this also happening in the urban areas of Greece? In, like Athens, how is Athens doing? First of all, Athens is experiencing the, um, the turbulences and the impact of the economic crisis more severely than in the countryside. My family, for example, we live in a small town, we produce maybe 80-85% of our food. Um, and part of the way of the fact that I was able to go around and do movies and uh, coming here is that I'm partly also a farmer. Um, but uh, there is of course a huge new understanding like only in the last 10-12 months we see young people especially occupying empty spaces and dedicating them into the production and appreciation of good food. Maybe an urban garden or a open, open, um, open space, cultural space or, uh, or, a, or a, an earth market, a, a farmer's market. So all these processes are happening right in front of our eyes. Maybe our politicians and our and the press doesn't really focus on that. But in my opinion, in Greece, Greece undergoes right now this type of social fermentation that creates all those solutions at the social level that brings people together and they find ways and alternatives to this crisis of this economic system which is proven to be a, a criminal economic system in the case of Greece. There are people dying because of this severe crisis that happened in one day. It was like this this little yellow car was built uh, about 50-60 years ago in France. It was high so people can, like, like the farmers can wear their hats in it. And it's, it's not by luck that we chose this car. It's a farmer's car. And it goes contrary to the Porsche Cayennes that like everyone got crazy about to show the totem of their fake wealthy wealthiness in the last 20 years <laughs> and uh, and this is of course something that inspires people inspires the many and uh, there is a big movement of the bostonistas now oh, in yes, yes. i was about to ask bostonistas last month we launched a, a website a collaborative uh, web space called bostonistas.gr from boston uh, for we also use this uh, word and um, Bostonistas is a structured approach to bring together all the voices of the little shiny dots on the little map of Greece uh, because there was a need that these dots come together, they communicate, there is a common platform to be created so people in the countryside find opportunities to expose their work maybe they are social, they are social organizations or they are professional farmers or entrepreneurs but also in the cities, start communicating a little bit with the origin of their food. And they also start understanding the processes behind is this a, Is this a generational thing? I mean, this is what the young people do. Absolutely. What about the older generations? What's their reaction towards what you're doing? I think uh, right now the conflict that we see in the society takes place in every, at every level. And in my opinion, the most beautiful conflict is the one that takes part in the farm, takes place in the farm the older than you and I'm an olive producer. Your father and, and you? And I can see that every day in my, my, my, my own uh, home that it's going through a little bit of a revolution uh, to try to, to change something that was re rooted deep in the farming traditions of my village for example and me having going around and interacting with rural communities and in the universities having interacted with best case practices and so on. It's always um, difficult to um, to, to be listened to, unless you get Hollywood award, award the Hollywood, and then suddenly everyone like takes you seriously. This is the world, unfortunately, that we live in. But I think it's a process, and um, there is definitely a lot of uh, farmers that took a lot of money from the European Union, and in, instead of investing in the land, they have been investing in nightclubs, whatever. But uh, simply now, because there's not so much money, this is the time of innovation. And uh, it's a great time because with a, with a click we can connect all over the world. Lovely. Then we pass the <coughs> stage to our friends. Sorularınız için e, hazırız lütfen. Ya yani, Türkçe de sorabilirsiniz. Anında tercümesini yaparız. Soru sormakta hangi dilde rahatsanız lütfen. Almanca'sı da var. S sizin. Lütfen. Oh. 
how do you cope with the industrial products? There is industrial products highly demanded, made demanded here in the market. You just walk out on the street, you can see it. So your products, how will they be favored against the industrial products? First of all, like fast food. First to mention that in this documentary we try to have a cool side, like we do not make, want to make propaganda for slow food or organic food. That's why we are interviewing conventional farmers, organic farmers, small scale, large scale, the minister versus the social activists and so on. Um, we, have, we are through that. Like in the early 90s, mid 90s, we saw the supermarket chains entering the neighborhoods and replacing the, the, the, corner, the, the, the corner stores, the groceries. And uh, we reached a point that, uh, yeah, Greeks were, were living at 180% above the sustainability level, 180%. And uh, we became the second fattest uh, people in Europe. So, yes, after the Germans, our, our kids are the most obese. Who? Greece. With the, which is like the, the, the stronghold of the Mediterranean diet. And uh, these are all types of anomalies that like, people start understanding. And of course, um, there is a whole trend that they say there is cheap food and then there is organic food, this, which is for the elite, which is for the few. But at the end, there are more and more people that start understanding, also because of the crisis, that what we call cheap food is not really cheap. What we call industrial food is not really cheap. If you consider the loss of water, the loss of biodiversity, the loss of soil resources, and the money that this costs to uh, revert these uh, this, um, problems. Or if you take the fact that only 6%, last year it was 7%, this year is 6% of our farmers are under the age of 35 years old. The people that are producing our food right now are 55, 60, 60 years old. In my opinion, this is an indication that something goes wrong. And it's not by luck that people start understanding that. They start looking otherwise. And of course, in my opinion, as long as there are 700 million Big Macs sold out there every day, we have a problem. And uh, it is always a long process. But I think it's important to believe in an idea, because like, say for example, this microphone, for example, did not exist like 60, 70 years ago, but to be one person to think of the idea, and he brought another person next to him, and they worked together, and they realized something. And um, I think how to cope with industrial food, I think uh, us, as people, that we want to, to change the food system, is by offering to the masses the opportunity to open their senses to real quality and tasty food. And by opening their senses to understand what's going on in the world. Actually, we need to redevelop our own communities. Now, the food travels all the way around. I mean, it is produced at one point and then travels all the way to Istanbul. You do not know who the producer is. If you know who the producer is, if you know who the food is coming from, then you take good care of that food. You don't let that go. You don't, you don't compare that to an industrial version. It's important that we recreate, reunite with our communities. And of course, it's a matter of priorities. Like, um, see for example what the, the local slow food has been doing with that little blue fish. The luffer. It's not about saving a little blue fish or the luffer. It's, of course, it's about saving the luffer, but it's about making sure that this bustling economy on the banks of the, on the shore of the Bosphorus will continue to exist. And, uh, you know, because the Lufer is the only one, not the only, but one of the indigenous, really um, sustainable drives of that economy. And in my opinion, it's not about a little fish, it's a symbol. So, how to cope with industrial food? Create symbols. The way we created with this little yellow car that dropped there, and we say that, okay, when I'm 30 years old, what should I do? Sit here and wait for the car to start from its own? I'm just continuing. And I walked all the way to Istanbul, as it seems. <laughs> I think the real issue is how do you make a living through farming? That's the reason why people are abandoning 
farms here in Turkey is that there's more money to be made in the city through other productive activities or creative industries, whatever. So, and uh, plus the second issue is there's the water is um, a big problem. That, for instance, in Istanbul we don't have water for agriculture. There's no policy for um, bringing water for agriculture. So there's no money, there's no water. So how? <laughs> so my question is, what is your what? What do you say to the EU uh, policy? Uh, you know, agricultural ministers. What do you want to have them to do? What's the recommendations you want? First of all, I cannot claim that I'm an expert of the Turkish agricultural economy. And again, it's amazing how similar we are. Our taste buds are, and our our food politics are so different. Um, I think these are like wider processes that like go more far in time, and they are not only about like doing a policy about like in increasing water resources in a particular area. Because it's simply so complex that you might take a policy that increases something but reduces something else. It's so interconnected. Um, I think at the end we need to to understand that we are here, and there are some other people in the countryside producing our food. But like we should really ask ourselves, where where was our food last night? In the sense that like we go out there and we maybe eat a banana or we eat a coffee plant and or we eat chocolate and again chocolate is like one of the most water intensive products in the world but then we don't think about what are these processes and I think it's not a matter of policy of course it's a matter of policy but like there are bigger wider and more important things that we need to address first by changing ourselves a little bit towards the more sustainable imagine for example there was a huge campaign where every balcony in Istanbul would have at least one plant. It's not about growing tomatoes and aubergines. It's about creating a knowledge system. And I want to say that, I want to hope that like what we experience in Greece right now, where there is no money in the cities, actually Athens is very screwed up in terms of money going in and out. Maybe we, I mean, we, we are so connected as I said, why don't we learn from each other? And like, I'm not saying that like uh, Turkey should stop enjoying this this amazing circumstance that it goes through right now. No debt, economic development, people get more wealthy. Sure, fine. But like, is there a way that we can keep doing that without destroying our rural economies, without destroying this what feeds us? I'm sure there is. So. And that's why I think it's important, and I, I, I want to hope that like some of you from here like would take a message uh, and like start putting this dialogue that already exists in this city to a different level. That like things will have to start happening. It cannot be that like um, a crisis is only 300 kilometers from here, and you think here that there is also the crisis is far away. And once we start getting, going through this realization, I think then we can start like putting the right type of pressure. Going back to your question, the key is rural development. The young farmers of Greece, or the example of Greece, are not like this old man and woman working in the fields and driving the old tractors. These are educated people. These are people that went to university. I, I'm about to finish my PhD, and I'm a farmer. There are people that speak two and three languages, and there are people that like are, are not living in isolation. They want opportunity, but you will be surprised that like, they don't expect from this this opportunity from the government anymore and from politicians. They are creating these opportunities through collaboration and social organization, and um, and the key, of course, is the rural development, sustainable rural development, because. If there is a space like this in the city center of uh, Istanbul, which is like of the utmost quality in delivering results, there should be a space of delivering the utmost quality and delivering, result, delivering results also in our countryside. And we don't see that. Our televisions are showing only urban shows. And of course, in Greece now, we also are watching a lot of the Turkish soap operas. So. <laughs> I think it's actually, it's also up to us to consumers. Are we willing to pay the required amount for that tomato? 
first we have to start looking at our budgeting system. I mean, we're spending more and more time and money on electronic devices, on clothing and etc. But when it comes to buying an egg or a liter of uh, milk, <coughs> we are looking for the cheapest possible variety. Of course, the farmer is not going to make money. So instead of asking, I think, Pavlos, how the farmer should be making money, we should look into the stuff we're buying and come up with priorities. Who do we want to invest our money into? Apple or bread? Which bread? Which tomato? I think it's up to us. It's right in our pockets. All those pennies that we work so hard to make, we have to spend it wisely. Uh, I have a question about, I mean, EU agriculture policy, because um, we're looking at it from a very Eurocentric perspective. There are trade tariffs that the European Union is exercising against other countries, other nations. We're looking at the food system, food security. I don't think we should be looking at it as a European thing, but a global thing. And then the question of what European farmers can lose and can gain is a totally different question. Because we're talking about subsidized uh, agricultural produce that exists in Europe that African produ producers cannot compete against. And I mean, these things are much more complex than just the well being and the soul food of I don't know, European farmers. It's a more, I think, global problem. And we're looking just at the Euro sorry, European aspect of it. I agree. <laughs> I think uh, for, for right now, and this is very apparent to the proposals for the common agricultural policy that have been put forward and have been delayed by the agricultural lobby. Um, are this all the, is, is a realization that like even Europe right now has an issue with its food security? For example, in 2011, the United States decided to destine one-third of its maize surplus towards biodiesel. And that was a major shortage in, in food in Europe. And not, not in, in the international maize market. Or last year, what happened in the United States with the droughts caused by climate change? There was a huge loss into the stocks of maize. Or now we have new global players like China that might come and say, look, how much does the soya cost? One euro, I, I give you one twenty, and they take it. So there is so much things happening, and I, I think our politicians are also start getting aware of the mistakes they did in the past. And of course, the the the, the, the citizens became more aware. But all this again, in my opinion, and this is my personal opinion, I cannot claim anyone's else's opinion. These indications that like there is something going wrong with our food system. We are, you have created a food system where we are eating here, but we are grabbing food from someone else in the world. We have created a food system that... Exactly, and gives it, it gives it to the supermarkets, for example. And uh, I think it is a question that we should all ask ourselves, what type of world we want from now on, because we cannot change the past. And uh, also we have to change ourselves, to, to, to challenge ourselves and ask ourselves how much time we have. Do we really have time? 90% of global biodiversity is lost only in the last century. 90%. So now we have so much knowledge where, so much knowledge, so much data, which, which we can actually can use in order to demand a more fair food system. But uh, it's not only up to the politicians, I, I, I insist on that. I think uh, the, the biggest political act is what we do with our fork. We are voting every day, and actually at least three times. And uh, it's important, like, maybe not you, but like, let's look outside on Mystical Island, all this swarm of people going up and down. I don't know, is there a single sustainable food outlet on Mystical Island? <laughs> this is not a problem of the politicians, in my opinion. There are people that demand it. The question is very specific and uh, contemporary. 
concerning uh, the revolutionary sweetening uh, plant of stevia, which, uh, as we know, uh, it is uh, zero calorie sugar, uh, and uh, also it melts in 200 degrees, as also has an advantage in cooking, and uh, children can eat uh, stevia made chocolate without having their teeth uh, uh, needing uh, to go to the dentist. Uh, however, I see that in spite that in Japan they have uh, converted uh, all their sugar into stevia based and in Latin America, in South America rather, as well where stevia rebatiana bertoni comes from Paraguay, I see a delay in Europe uh, in having it uh, exploited in factories. Do you think that uh, this is uh, the resistance of uh, the sugar lobby and to the governments that collect taxes from sugar because sugar obviously is an industrial uh, product and industrial food product that is within the scope of uh, the subject. I, I've looked a little bit on that because I happen to deal academically with plants. Uh, the, the, of course it's a very complex issue like everything but there is a simple question that I will give. To all these uh, valid things that you said about stevia, we forgot to mention that it's a major uh, uh, competitor to aspartame which is a Monsanto product. So I think this says everything. But you will not be surprised that now you get Coca-Cola. All, all, all, the, all the light drinks are using now stevia. Coca-Cola, I like Coke with stevia. So I'm a little bit curious and a little bit um, hesitant to go out and shout for stevia because there were too many people shouting for stevia. And then what did they achieve? That Coca-Cola uses the stevia. Like the way McDonald's were selling organic potatoes in Germany a few years ago. It is a process, it is complex, and in my opinion, an indication that we should take things seriously. Yes, we can change our world with our fork. Yes, we can change it in our garden, but we are nothing if we don't organize. And we are, again, nothing if we are 100 organizations dealing with the same thing and we're not talking to each other. And this is the, the, the case until very recently, and I want to hope that the young generation, or us, We'll build those top of bridges because um, at the end we are more. And um, if we only dis discover the potential that we have, we can get us in places unimaginable. Um, this, this new revolution, the young farmers movement, how old is this movement? These farmers I interviewed were about uh, up to 35. I think we one was 37. No, the, the movement itself. Like how? When did they start doing this? How did this young people's interest in farming start? How many years ago? Roughly. No more than a couple of years. I'm just wondering. Um, do you think if Greece didn't hit the crisis, would would this happen? Such an interest. Would that start? Or I'm just thinking we're in the city, we're so nicely comfortable having our food from the supermarket and everything. It takes an effort to think about it, to plan it, to to watch your refrigerator so that your one kilo of tomato doesn't rot, so you, you care for it, you care for what you paid for and everything. It's for the busy people in the city. I have a constant guilt feeling in myself whenever I buy, whenever... I mean, I'm just thinking, do we have to wait for that crisis to hit us in the face so we finally have to think about this? <coughs> but this is usually the case, even like, you know, we don't still really start... Eat, like in the my, my, mass, the mass, well, we don't really start eating healthy until a relative or a friend of us is uh, diagnosed with cancer. Yeah, exactly. And. Um, <coughs> Evolutionarily, I think that our brain is developed in such a way that cannot look above 10 years. Definitely not the brain of economists and politicians. <laughs> um, but um, the crisis does not only mean problems. Like even the etymology of the word crisis means judgment and doing the right thing. And uh, it's a little bit like uh, having an economy and putting it to a diet. At the end, it's not so bad. <laughs> and, um, um, but of course, it has to be um, supported with, but with other measures, like the word austerity. People freak out about the word austerity. And I think uh, 
the fact that like uh, Greece, for example, right now is uh, the only country in the European Union that has been operating with a negative GDP since five, six years already. I think this is a blessing for the future. And uh, I wish, I pray my politicians and my journalists, our journalists could understand that and inspire the society to understand that we are creating a model for sustainable life and try to organize that. And I'm hoping that Bostonistas will, <laughs> will, will, will succeed, to, succeed to do that. But I don't think that the growth can go on for, for, for forever. I'm sorry I'm telling this to you. It might be different from what you might think. <laughs> Good. So I'm hoping by the time that uh, there will be some crisis of any sort, because the real crisis is the one that we share everyone. Like we have food crisis, we have bio crisis. Money come and go. By that time, I'm hoping that we will have like a easy solution to suggest, because you cannot like expect that what worked in Greece will also work for Turkey or for Germany. But uh, I think that the crisis has uh, pushed, has made people like there was no other option. It stopped. The engine stopped. Nothing. The political planning was like, uh, oh, next week we need to take uh, next Wednesday we need to take the sixth installment from the IMF and the European Bank Central Bank. What to do? Well, you cut 20% of everyone's salary. And these are the type of processes that happen too fast. And people reacted by first only buying Greek food. A shift towards uh, domestically produced food, which was not the case. We were importing 68% of our food. 68%. And um, they buy domestic clothes, domestic shoes. They find alternative ways. Uh, to petrol, to heat themselves, to heat their houses and cook their food. And these all things came because the, the engine died. There was no other way because you need to eat. You need to heat your home. You need to cook your food. Maybe this is not something that, um, you know, the Troika <laughs> is not thinking that, you know, that there are also people behind the numbers, but there are people and the people are the most. And of course, we as civil society, we want to work with the people and have the governments only at the end of our of this change so we can push. It would be a shame that like if we were doing the opposite. such dire circumstances like the rain and the cold weather. Thank you. Thank you all.